everyone. Hey. Jenny, Felipe, and Jose. Um, so good to have you here. Uh, for anybody who's not familiar with uh, the business models of all these super cool companies, I just want the three of you to explain uh, to the group as, as easily as possible what, what you're working on day in and day out. Jenny, we'll start with you. Sure, yeah. Um, so Snap Fashion is a visual search engine for fashion. Um, so it started off about four and a half years ago where the idea is you see something you like, so something in a shop window, something in a magazine, um, you can take a photo on your mobile phone and then you find similar things to buy online. So the business model behind that side of the business is really super simple. Um, it's affiliate commission, website and mobile app. It kind of does what it says on the tin. Um, and then we've got the B2B side of the business as well. Um, and this is where we're sitting on quite unique kind of core technology, which is visual search around shape and color and texture. And we license that out to magazines, publications and retailers to basically let them enhance discoverability across their platforms. Cool, so that's Snap Fashion. Philippa, Chic by Choice. Hey, hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here. So Chic by Choice, we are a fashion rental marketplace. We rent designer items for consumers on one side. On the other side, we are tackling the B2B um, management, inv excessive inventory management. So we're trying to disrupt um, this part of the market by basically renting and reselling and creating more value than the alternative that they know today, which is basically massive discounts or outlets. Cool. And Jose, you are the veteran of the group. Farfetch has been around since 2008. Indeed. And, yeah, what, um, and what is Farfetch <laughs> for those who uh, need a little introduction? So basically, uh, we're a platform, we're an e-commerce platform for um, top um, luxury retailers and brands. Um, we're, you can call it a marketplace, but we're a very centralized and curated marketplace. Um, so we have supply coming from 35 countries, um, demand um, in over 120 countries. Um, US is our largest market, but we have um, sites and offices in Japan, China, uh, South America, uh, Russia as well. Uh, so it's a very global supply and demand platform for, for luxury fashion. Excellent. Good. Well, it was quite, quite a range, quite a range here. Jenny, uh, we were talking before this panel, and I... Um, I really like, there's a tool that Snap Fashion does where if you see a photo or, or any image at all, um, you can, it, it's almost like a little, like a lasso tool, yeah. you know, for anybody familiar with Photoshop where you can say, oh, I like the shirt that I see on someone else, try to find something similar. Yeah. Um, and I can tell that it's pulling color data, but what else can it glean from what you're giving it? Yeah, so um, the experiences are kind of different off across different platforms. So for mobile, we lead with color because for fashion, color is like instant gratification. So being able to have an app where you can take a photo of a color and it throws you back similar colored things, it's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, so we can search about um, half a million brands in under half a second and quickly go color and texture. Um, and then if you like something, you can delve a little bit deeper. Um, so that's when we've got the snap similar button and then you can do shape matching. So we kind of bring out results so you can hone in on what it was you liked about that item. Um, so that's very much the mobile-led experience, nice and quick. With web, like you said, you can do the lasso and get kind of into shape a bit quicker. Um, and then one thing that we recently announced is putting Snap into fitting rooms. So at that point, it's all about shape. Oh. So for me, it's about like, we've got all these kind of tools at our disposal with the algorithm, and it's kind of how can you tap into those different relevant bits on the, the different platforms. Philippa, I had mentioned Rent the Runway to you because in, in the United States, I'm quite familiar with that. It's the idea of I don't have the money for a couture dress, but I would love to rent it for a night and I, I can afford that. But your business model is a little bit different. Yes, basically from the start, we are doing the model on according to demand. Uh, we also had a chance to realize in our first year in business that our customer, uh, they were fashionable, they were trendy, but they were not as much season driven. So this gave us an opportunity to basically disrupt an area in retail that has been quiet for a while, which is excessive inventory management. So instead of just going after um, buying upfront, eight months before actually the collections arrive, Chic by Choice basically buys according to demand. Okay. And also we focus not only on in-season items, but also on the excess inventory, which actually gives us more margin but our customer is still fulfilled and they still love the product because they are product driven, they're not season driven. Mm -hmm. 
So Zay, uh, again, having Farfetch have, has been around a while, what do you think? What do you think is the the largest trend that you've seen since since people really started to get used to browsing on mobile um, and 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 getting familiar with a much smaller screen for something that you know fashion by nature is visual and beautiful and you want to see it, as much of it as possible. Um, yeah, definitely mo mobile is a, is a big, big uh, trend. So it's, uh, it accounts for um, half of the traffic um, to Farfetch. Really? 50% for yeah, you? 50%. And it's been growing very fast. So in the, in the past two years, it went from uh, 30 to 50%. Um, and it's interesting because our average order value is um, around $700, so it's a very high-end high, um, high -end customer. Mm -hmm. So the question was always, will a customer buy a $1,000 dress from a screen this size? They do, actually. And uh, what we also see is a lot of discovery on mobile, um, add to basket, and then finalize on, on desktop. So there's a lot of... I mean, the difference conversion rates between devices, um, they're, they actually don't tell you the full picture because um, you, you, really, um, you really have to look at the whole graph, device graph, and the whole um, user journey. And, and mobile is, is a major, major part of it. Jenny, I know you have a computer science background. Um, it sounds like you almost got into fashion a little bit by accident um, as part of a thesis you were working on in school. And you mentioned to me that discovery is, it, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a twofold, especially on mobile, where I think something's very focused and you can, you can uh, kind of lose your way pretty easily um, if, you're, if you're just browsing around, but that people want to find what they're looking for, but then they also sort of want to be surprised because they don't realize that they love those pair of shoes, but you just showed them to them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the psychology behind shopping is fascinating, and I guess we've seen all sorts of things which you don't expect to see. Um, I did an engineering degree and my friends used to joke that I shop like a man, but it's <laughs> quite interesting. You've got these very different behaviors. So sometimes you're super targeted, you know what you want, you're just gonna go in and buy it. Other times you kind of, you've got an occasion in mind, you don't really know what you're looking for. And um, the impact that that kind of psychology of shopping has on technology and the platforms that you're using to drive it is fascinating. So um, Snap, for instance, um, works from pure computer vision. So we do kind of, pixel level analysis of the image rather than going down that kind of deep learning and machine learning side because when you've got a small user base at the beginning, those kind of results of I've just searched for a dress, actually that's a really cool pair of shoes. If you've got algorithms running off that, you could be in deep trouble in the future. Yeah. <laughs> so machine learning, I suppose it has an interesting place in fashion and certainly a, a, you know, an online fashion marketplace. Um, but you do have to be careful because it's such a, I mean, what is more personal than fashion, really? Exactly, yeah, and I think that's what some of these guys are doing with curation. That's where it becomes really, really intelligent. So being able to merge that kind of human aspect of fashion with what some people are doing on technology, that's where kind of the magic happens, and that's where you see the conversions go up. Philippa, I am very impressed with when I, when I browse Chic by Choice and I see a dress that I think I'm going to love. And it, it looks like it's gonna fit me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty small, so I, th I think I've chosen the right dress, but you've really gone a step further um, because if I get that dress and for whatever reason it's not the right dress, I've got a backup dress. Um, so you, is it, did you have enough foresight to have that built in from day one or did you learn along the way that size is really hard, especially when you're not trying it on in a fitting room? So we started with asking ourselves, we are two co-founders, and we started by asking ourselves if it was us, uh, what would actually drive a rental or not drive a rental? And sizing was definitely the key point. Uh, so we answered, yes, basically we need to be sure of sizing. And that was from day one on our website. So we, also, we offered a free second size from day one. We also leverage sizing tools that they're there in the market, but we feel that it's all about creating trust for our customer to have that first perfect experience, then they get addicted to the service and they love it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that was there from day one and it has been a, a key point of the business that no, no one else in Europe has uh, on their platforms. Yeah. How many, how, 
How often, and of course this, this, this is all about sizing and, and it ha has really nothing to do with your model, but how often do people say, well that size did not work for me at all? How often does that happen? We are talking about 15% of people. 15? Yes, but basically uh, in terms of logistics model, we've made it so that people can receive also a backup style if they contact us in the first 24 hours. So it's all about guaranteeing that the customer has that perfect experience no matter what, yeah. Now you, uh, you do next day delivery within the UK, correct? Yes, and a lot of European countries. And a lot of European countries as well. Who's your biggest market uh, beyond the UK? So our second biggest market right now is Germany. Uh -huh. So it's the German market, yes, we've been growing a lot. They love their galas, uh, they their dresses. It's interesting, <laughs> it's interesting because UK is more of a black tie market and Germany has been more of a cocktail dress market. So culture also has an impact for sure. Yeah, I would think that this is a real learning experience of figuring out what different markets tell you about people's extracurricular activities and what they need to dress up for and, and, and what works in different places. Yeah, it's really interesting. It has been a discovery also for us, Chic by Choice. Our consumer in the beginning, we assumed that it would be a bit younger than it actually is. Uh, it's a corporate, corporate woman. Uh, most of them are monks. Uh, they're great at their job and they love fashion, but they want the convenience of the service. So actually, part of our job is understanding who uh, is this uh, customer uh, and trying to find as many as possible. So it's been quite interesting to, to understand from our first um, idea to actually being in the market and understanding who has purchasing power uh, who has actually the willingness to rent and what do they want, who is this person. So it's been quite a journey. That's really interesting, yeah, because my initial thought would be if you're renting something, it's, you might be a little bit younger, the, the price makes a lot more sense to do it this way, but you're finding out that it's, it's really people with a lack of time. Exactly, it's for the, basically it's for the money rich, but time poor, basically mm -hmm. that has been what we have finding out. And a customer on average is spending 100 uh, euros, around 80 pounds. So they're not super price sensitive. Jose, you mentioned that the average item uh, that someone would pick up from Farfetch is $700 and that your biggest market is the US. So the West is the number one market. Um, UK number two, Greater China, which includes China, Hong Kong, Macau, uh, number three. And we have a very large business in Japan, Korea, Australia is quite large as well, um, and then it just trickles down. I would think with that price point, you must have folks who are browsing for a longer than average time than some of your fashion competitors. Would that be true, do you think? It's, um, I'm, I'm not sure. It's difficult to, to benchmark. There's not much um, data uh, available, um, but yeah, so but, but you see different markets with very, with very different behaviors. For example, returns, uh, returns rate in Germany is the highest in the world. So um, we're, in our business, it's around high 30s. Uh -huh. um, and in Japan, it's 2%. So, which is not necessarily a good thing, because it means that they only buy when they're absolutely sure right. you know, that it's going to be, because they don't like returning. Returning is, is not part of their culture. Yeah. Um, so you see, you know, a big difference in the in the way people browse the site, the kind of brands they, they're looking for, the kind of price sensitivity, um, sensitivity to um, shipping cost. For example, the Americans they just expect free shipping these days. So it's um, <laughs> and and it's so and even if they're buying very high ticket items, if you don't offer free shipping. They, 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 you know, it's, it's a major drop in conversion rate. So it's, it's, it's really uh, interesting to see the cultural uh, differences. And how long have you been serving the greater China region? How long have um, you been serving? So we, so we launched our Chinese uh, website uh, roughly one year ago. Mm. Uh, we were always shipping to China. Um, but with, with a proper, you know, uh, local language, local payment systems, local team, uh, local customer service, etc. Uh, that's been uh, 12 months now, and it's uh, it paid off. So it's uh, we're very happy with the growth in China. It seems like that's the that's the 
It's the common thing. <laughs> Everybody's doing it. Um, and, um, well, there are a lot of people in China who want to buy a lot of things. But uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because, um, uh, the, the, and I think, you know, um, fashion and, and tech, we're, we're really in the early days of the category. I think uh, businesses like Chinese and, and Philippa's, um, you know, are, are proof of that, that there's so, so many new ideas and business models and concepts. Um, and I think you, you're, you're going to see a lot um, of new ideas. And, um, it's one of the lowest um, uh, penetration in terms of online sales. So in, in luxury fashion, there's only 6% um, of sales are done online. So 94% are still in physical brick and mortar uh, stores. And given the size of the industry at a global scale, I think there are huge, huge opportunities for investors and, and uh, for the ecosystem in general. And because, of, because it's such a long tail and because it's so personalized, it's not like a winner takes all. So there's going to be a lot of concepts and ideas and models that, that will work. Um, and that's what's really exciting. So we, we feel like we're just in the beginning. You mentioned the difference between the German market and the Japanese market when it comes to returns. Um, you know, I'll, I'll admit it, I'm one of those people who I really want to try something on before I want to know what it feels like. You know, is, is it going to be breathable? There's just all these um, variables that make online shopping a little scary for me because I don't want to go through the trouble if I've got to return it, even if all of that is free and you gave, give me the box and everything. Now, how much, how much time do you spend, Jenny, uh, figuring out how to assure customers that? This is going to be painless and fun. And how much does that factor in? People like me who are a little bit hesitant. Yeah, um, so I think it's a massive problem for the online fashion industry in general. It's probably why we are at that kind of really early stage. Or was it 6% of luxury goods uh, bought online? Um, so for me, the reassurance isn't through kind of words and branding. I think that kind of thing, people, everyone's a bit bland, brand blind nowadays, I think, in fashion. So what we're trying to do is kind of make sure that we're there at all the different touch points in a user's journey. So when they're in a jam, they can get out the mobile app. We can help find them something quickly and pass them on to someone as quickly as possible. When someone's in that kind of browsing in front of the TV mode, it's like, how on earth can you mold your user experience so it's right for them? Um, and then same with what we're doing in Fissy Rooms. It's all about just kind of making sure that you're ever present. So as the brand grows, what we're trying to do with the whole kind of reassuring people that we're safe and kind of good to buy from. It's just kind of make sure that you understand their needs and you already speak to them as a consumer rather than doing. I think it's very easy to go down the whole kind of patronizing right. kind of line. And the other question that people say um, along this line is kind of you've got to play the long game. So if we find something for someone and then they buy it in a high street shop and we don't get any commission, that's absolutely fine because we ultimately generated their sales. So it's kind of having that belief that if you offer the best product for the user, that they'll just kind of trust you and they'll come back and you'll become part of their routine in a way for shopping. As these markets, you know, they, they, they've become so global um, and you can, buy, you can buy anything you want from anywhere you want and, and, and more often than not, people don't care. Or they care less than they used to, I suppose. Philippa, particularly with something like an you know, evening wear, a lot of people are very loyal to brands um, or want to be wearing something that is an exciting brand that someone else will think, ooh, I wish that was my dress. How much do you find that matters um, when you're offering a big variety of beautiful things? Are people as brand conscious as, as they have been in the past? I think that this new generation actually um, obviously, they interact with brands, um, but they are driven by exclusivity and by authenticity. And those factors actually are linked with brands and designer products. Uh, but what we've seen is that we are actually also uh, a discovery tool for our consumers. So we have around 90% of our um, partners are really well-known uh, brands that the consumers uh, all know by heart. And around 10% of our partnerships are actually uh, driven by the discovery element. We want to, act, to show our customers exclusive product. And we've been having quite a surprise because if they enter a website that everything is branded, then they love the exclusivity, discovery, finding a new brand that they also have never heard of. So 
I believe it's also about exclusivity and that fulfillment of having something that nobody else um, will have. So we're in London. I, I, I'm sure some of my New York friends will, will take issue with this, but I've always considered London to be the fashion capital of the world. You're, you're right in the middle of everything. And um, it, yeah, you guys get everything first. Uh, but, uh, Jose, do you, think that that, do you think that that matters in the same way that Silicon Valley still matters? It's, it's important to be there if you work in a certain type of technology and you're looking for venture capital and there's, there's an ecosystem that, that it, it just exists um, and it's very strong. Is it the same way for fashion here in London? Um, I, I think I'm biased, obviously, but I, <laughs> I think it is. I think it's a, it's a big advantage, um, not just London, but Europe. Um, if you look at actually um, who are the, 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 the innovators and, and actually the largest companies um, in the space, uh, you look at uh, Vente Privé invented the, the, the flash sales model. Um, in France, and Annette Aporté, you know, pioneered um, from London the, the whole idea of um, selling luxury um, online. And then you have ASOS, and you have, um, you know, so, so many um, interesting companies. And um, obviously, Janice and Philippus are, are, are part of that, you know, growing ecosystem. Um, and I think Europe has a massive advantage because we are. Um, close to a fashion savvy consumer, we're close to the brands, we jump on the Eurostar, we go and speak with the big uh, luxury groups who are, who are all based in Paris. Um, few of the largest, even in the mid market, a uh, few of the largest companies in the world are um, European. You look at Inditex, Zara, um, Zara Group, and, and you look at HM and, and Arcadia PLC here in the UK. So, so there's definitely um, you, um, a proximity to customers and to um, the industry um, and the ability to uh, hire talent, which uh, would be very, very difficult in, in the Valley. Um, not to mention, you know, um, investors that understand the space and, and that can add value in, um, in your board once, once they join. Um, I, I think the Europeans have a, um, a lead edge in that. Well, before we wrap up, I wanted to ask all three of you just a question, looking into the future, um, as far as technology goes, we're seeing some crazy stuff. Self-driving cars are on the horizon. Uh, private companies are launching rockets into space, and you know, we'll, we'll get to Mars eventually. I mean, what, what is on the horizon for fashion that is going to change the industry yet again? Jenny, what do you think? I was hoping you weren't coming to me first, sir. <laughs> um, for me, I think it's like this intersection between discovery and curation and how kind of being really targeted in your search kind of jars against that curated kind of editorial side that's always been so important in fashion. So I think there's going to be a lot of kind of people merging together, trying to come up with that kind of authentic fashion experience that people are trying to basically recreate that buzz that you get from the high street online. And I'm not sure that anyone's really managed that yet, so that'll be interesting to watch. Felipe, what about you? Um, just picking up on uh, what Jose said before, we are talking about a market that still is really traditional. So only 6% of the, of the luxury products are, are sold online. And what I see is the potential to actually disrupt even more this traditional market, create a new layer that actually, with technology, helps retailers go beyond what they ever expected um, and disrupt the current channels. So I believe there's the 94% yet to, to actually develop. Jose, do you see the department store going away? Uh, I don't. I think they have a place. And, and I think one of the biggest uh, step changes will be how the physical store merges with the digital store. And, and how those experiences, I mean, there's the buzzword omnichannel, but you can call it whatever you want, but it's really how you offer um, levels of service that, um, that are impossible to offer otherwise, uh, both in store and, and in your um, digital platform. Um, and for example, we just launched same day delivery in nine cities around the world. That, that would be impossible if you were working with a centralized warehouse. Yeah. Um, so so uh, there's going to be that merge of physical and digital, and I think that's going to unleash a lot of new ideas and, and, and fantastic, amazing customer experiences. Well, I thank three of you, all three of you very much uh, for joining me up on stage at Disrupt. Thanks to all of you for listening, and um, 
Have a wonderful rest of your disrupt. Thanks, everyone.